Mr. Cooper, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Put your hand down. Ms. Sears, please go ahead. Mr. Cooper, could you please state and spell your name for the court? Yes, ma'am. It's Barry Cooper. B-A-R-R-Y-C-O-O-P-E-R. And Mr. Cooper, do you have experience in law enforcement? I do. I've been working with law enforcement in one form or another for the last 30 years. I just worked with law enforcement a couple months ago, actually. Could you please outline your law enforcement experience for us? I started out at Gladewater Police Department as a dispatcher and reserve officer. That's Gladewater, Texas. And then I got hired as a full-time patrolman in Big Sandy, Texas, where I worked my way up to lieutenant. And then I was recruited by the Permian Basin Drug Task Force based out of Midland and Odessa. I worked there four years, three or four years, four years. And then I went back to Gladewater Police Department where I became the head of narcotics. And then after I quit law enforcement full time for Gladewater, I ended my career as a reserve officer back at Big Sandy, Texas. So there's three places I work to be, Gladewater Police Department, Big Sandy Police Department, and the Permian Basin Drug Task Force. And what is the Permian, per, I'm sorry, Permian Basin Drug Task Force? Well, back, back in the 90s, uh, the federal government paid uh, governors to have task forces, and there were like 42 different drug task force in the state of Texas at that time. And uh, I was one of those. It's, it's licensed through the district attorney's office. So we were considered a DA's investigator. Okay. What is an interdiction officer? A what officer? Interdiction. Okay. I-N-T-E-R-D-I-C-T-I-O-N. Thank you. Yeah, so an interdiction officer is a term for a police officer whose sole purpose is to stop automobiles, usually on pipeline typing highways, drugs, and drug cash. So they're trying to interdict uh, contraband on the highways in the United States. Have you worked drug interdiction? Yes, ma'am, I have. I worked seven years of intensive drug interdiction. Could you please tell me about your experience uh, conducting traffic stops and drug searches? Well, sure, sure. I, uh, I have over 800 narcotics arrests, ran over 100 search warrants. Um, I was an instructor at the police academy. I would I worked harder than any of the other agents um, where they would stop 10 to 15 cars and search per day. I would stop 30. Um, I had, I got started in Big Sandy where there was only one mile of highway uh, to work traffic on. And at that time, police dogs were new. And I trained my own drug dog and went and got it certified. So my chief let me use that dog on that one or two miles of highway where I made over a hundred drug arrests. That's what caused the Permian Basin Drug Task Force to, to recognize and recruit me. Okay. Do you have um, an idea of how many drug searches you've done during your career? It would definitely be in the thousands, but I would have no way of, of knowing the exact amount. Were you good at drug searches? My bosses claim, my bosses claim I was. My uh, commander, Tom Finley, made a statement to the Associated Press during a, a media interview. 
he said that in his opinion i was one of the best officers best drug cops in the state and probably the united states and he ended the quote was saying i made more cases than all of his agents put together so in his opinion i was all right are you familiar with the odor of marijuana yes ma'am i'm very familiar with the odor of marijuana do you have training and experience relevant to understanding uh, the diffusion of marijuana odor through various types of materials i do i do in fact i i teach this principle i just uh gave an accredited class uh, to the seattle criminal defense lawyers association on odor permeation where i taught that uh, this simply the concentration of odor particles are going to be stronger at the source and as you move away from the source those particles get less and less and less which explains why we can't smell if if you're in idaho and there's a dead dog in texas you can't smell that dead dog because by the time those odor they call it a just notable noticeable difference jnd well there's a just notable notable difference when moving toward the contraband that's like how a dog that's how a dog okay let me stop so a canine works by tracking odors and he is able to locate the source because he finds the areas that have the most particles that have permeated through something. Uh, the, the permeation of odors is important to understand because, you know, they say, how is it a, a dog can smell through a PVC pipe that's floating around in the gas tank and smell through the gas and the metal how can a dog smell through that well the truth is the dog doesn't smell through anything police officers don't smell through anything odors permeate and i would demonstrate this in class in the uh, canine classes that i taught i would get a bag of uh, can of sardines and put it in a ziploc baggie and then pass it around to the class and you could not smell the sardines but by the time the class was done at the end of the day you could hold that bag up and you could smell the sardines because even plastic has little microscopic pores so it takes time for those odors to permeate out just like a contraband hidden in pvc pipe floating around in a gas tank like i talked about a while ago so the odors permeate out of the PVC pipe actually permeate through the gasoline and then permeate outside the metal container and leaves a scent cone or those just noticeable difference or the particles on the outside of the gas tank and that's what the canine is smelling okay. so does the material that marijuana is contained in affect odor diffusion then and, and speeds of permeation and how much is able to get out it it does it does and just you know common sense will help you with that if you hide something uh in a sponge container a sponge has a lot of pores that you can see it's not going to contain that odor as much as say a glass jar and usually the leakage on a glass jar comes around the lid but yes certain items slow permeation oil grease slows permeation that's why um uh, by the way this officer on this case he's a good interdiction officer i could tell and he he probably knows this that when he gets a load of contraband a lot of times it's uh surrounded with grease and then they tape it tape it up that's because grease is not very porous and it slows the permeation to give the smuggler time to to make it through the checkpoints. Okay. Uh, during searches, have you found marijuana that you were unable to smell prior to the search? Yes, all the time. 
Are you saying if I stopped a car, I never smelled marijuana, but I, I got probable cause or permission to search or the canine alerted and then I found narcotics like marijuana that I didn't smell upon approaching the car? Yes, that happened a lot. Okay. So have you, through your training experience, gained a working understanding of the circumstances under which officers can and cannot smell various amounts of marijuana that are packaged in various ways? located different places. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Okay, uh, so has your experience led you to understand when someone is likely to be able to smell marijuana and when they're not based on how much marijuana there is, based on how it's packaged and where it's located? Most definitely. Okay. All right. Do you have experience training police or prosecutors in drug cases? I do. As I mentioned before, I was an instructor for the police academy. And uh, recently I taught a class to the Seattle Criminal Defense Lawyers Association. That's pr probably six or seven times I've been called on to lecture in front of defense lawyers. The prosecutors usually aren't there, but they get invited. All right. Uh, do you still work in law enforcement? I don't work as a law enforcement officer, but I do work with law enforcement when I need to. In fact, uh, two about two months ago, I think I saved a, a, a drug agent's life. I was working a case um, I won't say where, but I've got the proof of all of this. And the client that was talking to me said that a DEA agent was going to go tomorrow and meet a cartel member to buy a kilo of methamphetamine. And I learned that the cartel member knew it was going to be a DEA agent coming because an informant told the cartel guy, said, hey, this is going to be a DEA agent. So the DEA was about to walk into a trap. I got on the phone with Texas lawyer Bobby Mims. He dialed straight to the feds. We got everybody on the phone. I told them what I knew, and uh, they thanked me for that. Now, I'm not going to help police find drugs because I personally don't agree with the drug war, but I'm, there's no way... I'm going to sit back and watch an officer get hurt because contrary to popular belief, I am not anti-cop. I think we need police, especially now that everything's gone so crazy. I want cops around. Now, I don't always agree politically with certain laws, but I'm not anti-law enforcement at all. And I'll end with this. I, you can look on my YouTube channel and I just posted a, ser a five-part series that breaks down law enforcement's encounter with use of force. I'm trying to teach the public. A lot of times a police officer uses the proper use of force and the public on, online just trashes them, telling them that that's, uh, you know, you use too much force. So I, I made a series and I didn't do this on purpose, but when the series was finished, I had sided with the officers four times and sided with the motorist one time. I think I wanted to just add that, that I'm not anti-police. Okay. Uh, what is your job now? I am an expert witness. I have been for 15 years. I own and operate the website NeverGetBusted.com, which uh, features my services. When working as an expert witness, do you assess officers' conduct and credibility in drug stops and searches? At, two to five times a month I'm reviewing discovery. I've literally reviewed hundreds of packs of discovery in the last 10 years. Do experts in your field reasonably rely on officers dash cam and body cam videos to form opinions or inferences? Yes, of course. How about deposition testimony? Is that something experts in your field rely on? I love depositions because then I don't have to guess what somebody is going to say or how they're going to testify. And I understand when you worked in law enforcement, you worked primarily in Texas. Uh, is your familiarity with police, drug search, and seizure techniques 
jurisdiction specific or does it apply to practices in Iowa as well? Well, no, mar marijuana in Iowa smells just like marijuana in Texas. Stopping a car uh, in one state has the same uh, formula as stopping a car in another state. Now, you're right, I was a Texas police officer, but police from all over the United States would come and ride with me for, for me to train them. So I was able to train them on Texas highways and they could go back to their various states and use what I taught them. Have you previously testified as an expert on drug searches in matters like this? I have. I've been called. Well, I've worked hundreds of cases and there's always the chance that I may need to testify. Ten years ago, when I left the United States, I sought the advice of this Texas lawyer, again, Bobby Mims. He's kind of mentored me. And I changed from being a testifying expert to a consulting expert. Now I'm back as a, offering my service as a consulting expert because one good thing about COVID is it's, it's opened up the doors for digital testimony. Um, but yeah, prior to, to me doing solely consultations, uh, consulting, I was called to testify five separate times. I actually testified three times and the other two, it was settled before I got to the stand. Sorry, my computer cut out there. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can hear you and see you. Yes, ma'am. You never there. blinked off the screen. <laughs> All right. Your Honor, at this point, the defense would like to tender Mr. Barry Cooper as an expert witness in the areas of police conduct and drug stops and searches. That's really not Iowa practice, Ms. Sears. Um, Mr. Spears, do you have any reaction to her request? I agree with the court. He can testify as to his experience and his training and knowledge, and the court gives his testimony the same way as any other person. We don't have to certify a person as an expert to offer a specific opinion. Yeah, uh, as long as we're on the topic, Ms. Sears, um, certainly uh, making that request here in front of me is absolutely harmless. Uh, I'm going to deal with it the way I would deal with it, but don't ever do that in front of a jury. Uh, I know that I would react badly uh, because it's in front of a jury. It's a request for the judge to comment on the credibility or not of a particular witness, which is not the judge's job, at least not in Iowa. And so um, um, I would like to think that I would be gentle about it. Uh, others. Uh, might be less so, but but in front of a jury, that question would would, would not be proper. But as I say here, it's absolutely harmless. Uh, I'll listen to what he has to say, and I'll make a decision about whether about how much weight I give to it. Go ahead, Mr. Cooper. What have you done to prepare for today's hearing? Well, I reviewed the discovery that you sent, which contained the video deposition. I think a police report. Um, based on your training and on your review of the, the evidence in this case, could you please provide your opinion to the courts on what likely happened during this traffic stop? Sure. My, my opinion is exactly what I emailed you after I reviewed the discovery a few times. My opinion is this, uh, this interdiction officer is good. I can tell that he has been out there on the highway. I can tell by his rhythm and by his flow. He knows what he's doing. And interdiction officers that are good like that oftentimes get impatient and they get good enough to pretty much know if somebody's got drugs or not and then they start digging for probable cause. Um, no disrespect to Miss uh, Leanna because I have a, a drug rehab center in Mexico that I still uh, treat drug addicts um, but it was obvious to me, and I'm, this is looking through the eyes of a police officer like I used to be. Upon approaching her car, I would have noticed that she had signs of being an addict. 
you know, um, she had some jaw movements, and specifically, it looked like methamphetamine. Um, her eyes were, you know, wide open and in disarray. And again, I'm not, I'm not judging her. I'm just giving my honest testimony. And I think it was particularly interesting because the officer had already had decided pretty quick that he had already smelled marijuana. And I knew that is about in the 130 mark or two minute mark because he radios and tells another officer, if you're not 10 six, which is busy, can you, you know, come to my location for a PC search? So that tells me he is already claiming to have smelled the marijuana. Um, so, unfortunately, because, because drug laws and such are such a taboo subject for everybody, um, officers start thinking that, you know, what's the harm in saying I smell marijuana, whether I smell it or not? I get to search their car, and if they don't have anything, they get to go home. At least this is how I used to justify it. And if they do have drugs, I made a drug bust. And I made a lot of drug bust based on lying, saying that I smelled the odor of marijuana uh, when I didn't. I know now, now that I've matured and I, I'm get, I got a better grasp of how the American courts work, I realized that, you know, protecting the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution is much more important than catching somebody with a little baggie of meth. So it also looked looked to me like maybe he didn't have a canine available. Um, and when you know you don't have a canine available, say your dog's in heat or something, then it's time to pull out the I smelled, I smelled marijuana trick. Um, would you like me to continue about the marijuana flakes and testify to that? Sure, Mr. Cooper. What, whatever you recall about your observations of this stop and, and what significance. R right. So, so point is, as politely as I can say it, police do lie about um, smelling marijuana. And they lie to get the probable cause to search. And that's, in my opinion, that's what that's what happened because he, it's it's really important to note this officer said that he smelled the odor of raw marijuana instead of burning marijuana. If he would have said burning marijuana, I wouldn't be here today testifying because there's no way that you can prove he didn't smell burning marijuana. Somebody could have smoked a joint the day before in her car, even without her knowledge, and burn marijuana sticks to the car. And I believe uh, Miss Leanna, when she, when he said, I smell marijuana, and she goes, I don't even smoke pot. I believe her. And when I learned that he had, it, the officer in his deposition, when I learned he s said he could smell two flakes of marijuana that were too small to even test, and then those two flakes being inside of a metal can, inside a passenger door, there's no way for that odor to permeate out and there be enough particles that far from the source, which would be outside the driver's door. There's no way for any particles to have been gotten that far. A dog couldn't have even smelled it from there. And then when, I, when, when the officer located the marijuana and he removed it from the car, he said that, that he, uh, okay, when he removed it from the car, he said then he could no longer smell it. So, so he's saying that he smelled those two flakes of marijuana and <laughs> something else too. If you smell raw marijuana, you know you've got a big load, a big load, because it takes a lot of raw marijuana to permeate enough odor out for those just noticeable differences to be detected. It takes a lot of raw marijuana. Now, I've approached cars before and smelled raw marijuana, and when I smell raw marijuana, I get excited 
because I knew it would be a big drug bust. And, uh, you know, I would search the car and not find the marijuana. So instead of letting the car go, I would get a dog and have my dog find the source of the marijuana. It's usually a hidden compartment of some type. So if this officer smelled the burning, if he smelled raw marijuana, he should have gotten a dog. He should have checked for compartments and such. That's why I just, I'm not saying he's a bad person. I think he's a good cop, but I think he did what I did and what so many other officers did. And he didn't, he did not smell that, that, uh, raw marijuana. Impossible. On a scale of one to 10, impossible. <laughs> Um, do you recall in the video Officer Cooley asking Officer McRae if it just jumped out at him? I do remember I'm that sorry. and in my report. I didn't catch the if the what jumped out at him? If it just jumped out at him. Okay. Sorry, Ms. Clampett. Yeah, so to me, that was a term between cops, like, it's a profiling term. And profiling is not illegal, you know, if you can... Get a traffic stop on the person, you can stop them. But it's a profiling term like, did she just jump out at you or what? And that's to, you, you know, tell the arriving officer that this is probably a good drug stop. Because I'm sure this officer has made a lot of drug arrests. I don't know that for a fact. So... When backup arrives, they're like, did she just jump out at you? That could also mean, is this an informant stop? You know, did you already have information or did she jump out at you? Because I would have stopped her too. As an interdiction officer, I would have stopped Miss Leanna. Sorry, Miss Leanna. Uh, the searches where you lied about smelling marijuana to create the appearance of probable cause, what were those searches actually based on? Well, they were based on me believing so much that there's probably drugs in this car, but I didn't have any way to get into it. So I lied and said I smelled marijuana. And again, what's the harm is, is how I justified it. If, if, if I lied about the marijuana and I searched the car, I kept the motorist maybe an extra 30 minutes. But if there weren't any drugs, they got to leave. And I didn't write them a ticket. So that's how I justified, justified lying. I don't have anything further. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Yes, uh, Mr. Spears might have some questions for you. Mr. Spears, any cross-examination? Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Cooper, on the last note, you indicated that you previously lied in the, that you smelled marijuana when you, in fact, did not while you were a police officer, correct? Yes, sir. On how many occasions did you then go into court and testify to the false fact that you smelled the old marijuana in a vehicle? Never, because I've never lied under oath. There's a difference in lying on the highway and lying in court. What's that difference? I'm under oath. And I respect were... and I respect the court. I really believe everybody should tell the truth and then see i'm not here to save mrs liana i'm not here to win this case i'm here to testify as to my opinions and then the judge the courts make those type of decisions those aren't the decisions for me to make so it's okay to violate to lie to violate a person's constitutional right but you draw the line once you take the oath in front of a judge Oh, no, Mr. Spears, in fact, if you listen to my prior testimony, I, if, if I didn't say it was wrong, I'm telling you it is wrong to lie to gain probable cause, and it's wrong to lie in court. Um, I, at that time, in my immature state, and the, the peer acceptance I got for making drug busts, Yes, I would do something wrong and immoral, and I would lie about smelling marijuana. But I've never lied in court about probable cause. Okay. Sir, you indicated you've testified on three prior occasions as an expert, correct? Yes, that's right. 
all of those occasions were for defendants, correct? I'm sorry, were for what? For the defense? Yes, for the defense, that's correct. How much do you charge? You know, I work on a sliding scale. Sometimes I, I do a lot of pro bono cases. I don't do as many pro bono cases as I used to because it was just wearing me out. When was the last time you actually worked as a police officer? Let's see, that would be, I graduated academy in 1990 and eight years, 1998. And how many years did you actually have as a police officer? Eight. Since that time, you have basically been employed as, I think your testimony was as a expert witness or expert consultant? Yeah, that's correct. Now, I, after I left law enforcement, I became a very successful person. I had two car dealerships. I pastored a church. I had a tire shop. And then, you know, that lasted seven or eight years, something like that. And then I switched to being a consulting, I mean, a drug expert witness. In fact, you produced and put out a video as a tutorial of how to get away with hiding drugs, correct? Yeah, I sure did, yes. What was the name of that video? Never get busted traffic stops and never get raided. And in that video, you give people advice and tips as how to cover the odor of marijuana, correct? I do do that, and I do that because I do not think it's moral or right to put somebody in a cage for cannabis. And, you know, I started okay, saying sir, that 15 sir, years ago, could, and apparently sir, I was right. Sir, excuse me. Okay. It, it, would, it would make this hearing go a lot easier if you could answer the questions that I've asked your the attorney miss sears can have the opportunity to ask follow-up is that okay with you of course but if i start answering a question and, and i'm trying to answer the question you're just going to have to let me answer the question if you interrupt me that's fine i'll just stop sir in the video that you put out isn't one of your tips to use latex gloves when hiding marijuana so that the odor doesn't transfer yes because there's microscopic dust, which has an odor of marijuana, right? That only a dog can detect. Humans can't detect the microscopic dust. Uh, one of your tips is that people should eat marijuana if they're about to get pulled over, correct? Yes. Another is to use beer scents or fox urine or a cat to cover the odor of marijuana. Yes. You've put out tutorials or videos as to how to smoke marijuana in public, correct? Yes. You've put out videos as to how to smuggle marijuana through an airport. Yes. You even small, put out amounts, videos. small amounts of marijuana for medicine. You've also put out videos as how to drink and drive and never get busted, correct? Hang on, no, 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 no. You, you need to watch that video. I made it clear in the description and I made it clear in the video. This is not teaching people how to get away with drunk driving. I am a big proponent of getting those people off the highway. What that video did was teach people how to give themselves a field sobriety test, the horizontal gaze nystagmus, heel to toe and one leg stand. It taught people, it's teaching people to self-administer that test before they get in their car. And if they fail any of those tests, to wait another hour, retest, and then go. There's a difference. There's a difference in, you know, marijuana, somebody possessing marijuana that's causing no harm and somebody drunk driving. So I do not teach people how to, you know, get, get by any laws that cause harm.
you've indicated today and also in your website that you had a essential essentially a personal shift in your opinion about drugs. Is that fair? Yes. Could you outline for the court what is your personal experience in drug consumption? Judge, is that is that necessary? Yes. Yes, answer the question. Okay. Um, well, actually, I was a drug addict at one time. I, I became addicted to methamphetamine. Um, but I will say I have been completely sober. I don't even drink anymore. I jog five miles a day, and I've been sober like that for five years. Prior to my methamphetamine addiction, I worked with a lot of psychedelics. When you say you've been sober for five years, does that exclude the use of marijuana? Yes, it excludes the use of marijuana, except when I travel out of the Philippines to a legal country, then I'll smoke pot or eat cannabis. But I can't. the laws here in Philippines are too strict. Do not, I'm sure y'all have heard, you do not want to get caught with drugs here. And that's where I live. I've lived here the last three, almost four years. You testified um, about the odor of marijuana uh, substantially, correct? Yes. And in summary, that there is an odor to raw marijuana, right? Raw marijuana does have an odor. The, the regarding the permeation of the odor of marijuana, um, do you have any individualized training or education in that field? I do not have a degree in science. If that's do you have any? Is. Do you have any published papers that are peer reviewed on that topic? No peer reviewed papers, but you know my peers apparently reviewed my work when I used to teach odor permeation to, you know, thousands of police officers. Burning burnt marijuana has a different odor, correct? Yes. And you testified that a, um, I don't want to mischaracterize your testimony, but essentially a clever police officer would lie about burnt marijuana over raw marijuana because there's no way to know, right? I did say that, yeah. And, but in this case, the officer said raw marijuana, right? Yes, that's what he said. But you're essentially still calling him a liar. I'm, no, I'm not calling him a liar, but I'll say he lied this time. You know, a liar is somebody who would habitually do it. I don't know what the guy does on his own time. I don't know what he does on other traffic stops. I know what he did on this traffic stop. And, you know, I don't want, I don't want to cause any harm to anybody, even this officer, but I have to call it like I see it. It's impossible for him and even a dog to have smelled marijuana from that driver's window. When you were a police officer, did you break the law? Yes. In what way? I lied about probable cause, and the only other time I broke the law is I stole money. You would steal money from who? Unfortunately, and I talk about this freely in, in interviews and such, um, I made all my crimes public. Um, you know, usually Mexicans... You know, I worked down there close to the border, and Mexicans didn't complain. And they were taking large amounts of cash into Mexico, and sometimes I didn't know if it was drug money or not. And I would peel off. The most I ever stole would be like $100 at a time, and I know you're going to ask. So I did that probably six times. I never planted drugs on anybody. What is your own personal criminal history? Oh, geez, I've been arrested nine times, all misdemeanors. What for? I have one for a, a fight when I was 17 years old, a fist fight. 
I was arrested for a gun charge as I was a police officer. That's why that's not a conviction because I was a cop. I was allowed to carry the gun. Back in the day, I was immature, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and I did a lot of bar fighting. So I got into a bar fight. Guy started it. He was bigger than me, and a jury found me not guilty. It was self-defense. And then I was arrested through a string of arrests that are considered among a, a lot of important people that these arrests were retaliation for my activism. Okay, what were those arrests? Okay, one was false report to a peace officer, dismissed because I didn't lie to a cop. I set a fake marijuana grow room in Odessa, rigged it with cameras, and it was to get a girl out of federal prison because the police there had planted drugs on her. I was successful with that sting. She got out of prison. The judge saw, saw it and released her. And um, uh, so a couple of years later, before the statute of limitations ran out, the Texas Rangers arrested me for that, for false report to a peace officer. Then they arrested me for false report to a peace officer again when I did my bag drop stings. I would, you know, put cash and a hidden GPS unit inside a bag and then put it out for cops and film them to see if they would, if they would take the money. Um, and then I got arrested one time for not having a private investigator's license. And that's again for my activism. That got dropped because I was a member of the media. So I did a lot I did a lot of a lot of uh, controversial activism, but I never broke the law. I had lawyers there telling me, do it this way and it's not in violation of the law. That's why none of it stuck. It, it's a war. It's a drug war. I got I got into something bigger than I ever thought. I'll admit that I, I stood up against the American police force. I didn't break the law, but there were times I did it in a, in a harsher way than I wished I would have by, you know, like cussing at police officers, stuff like that. I'm not like that anymore. This was 10 years ago, but, uh, every activist event I did was, was for a good purpose. It was try to free somebody from jail or try to, you know, expose crooked cops. Now, I will not do that again. I will not bust cops. I was offered a reality show to come back to the United States and do cop busters, and I told them, no way. I would never do that again. So I, I don't work in the field anymore. This is what I like to do. I like to blog and vlog and testify. Sir, of those arrests that you've outlined, are you saying no criminal conviction ever resulted? I'm not sure. I think there was one that I pled to because there were four uh, arrests all wrapped up in one. I, I I really don't know. When was the last time you were in the United States? I left in... Oh, I've got that timeline. It, it's been probably 13 years, I think, last time I counted. But I'm coming back. Did you leave to flee the jurisdiction of any court? No, of course not. Who is James Gill? James Gill's my lawyer. Why did James Gill write that you risked federal kidnapping charges to save your family and left everything you had built for in this country? So when you asked me if I was fleeing uh, jurisdiction, I thought you meant did I have a warrant or something. But yes, my autistic stepson was being molested by the father. The father had custody. He couldn't handle the autistic kid anymore. So he gave the kid to us and I fled the United States to save my life and to stay out of prison. No more questions. Ms. Uh, Sears and Redirect. Just one, Your Honor. 
Um, Mr. Cooper, in your experience, does police culture encourage lying about probable cause to justify searches? I'm sorry. It broke up. You broke up. It, oh, I'm sorry. In your experience, does police culture encourage lying about probable cause to justify searches? Yes. Could you tell me anything about that? Sure, we talked about it all the time. You know, I would, an, an officer would call me out to his car, to a traffic stop, and he would debrief me what's going on. He said, I can't get probable cause. We can't get to a dog right now. I'm going to lie. I said, go, go for it. I've seen that, unfortunately, hundreds of times. It's a really, really common common thing because it's so hard to catch. Thank you. Nothing further. Ms. Uh, Sears, any, any further evidence? No further witnesses, Your Honor. Yeah. Um, may Mr. Cooper be released? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Cooper, uh, you're, you're released. Uh, this is a public proceeding, and if you want to continue, you uh, to uh, listen in, you're welcome to do so, but, but uh, your, your uh, presence is no longer required. Um, Mr. Uh, Spears, I think Ms. Sears has rested. Is there any rebuttal by the state? No, Your Honor. All right. Um, I believe Ms. Sears has, has submitted a uh, brief um, is there anything uh, further that uh, you want to submit, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sears? Sure, Your Honor. Whether or not there was a lawful basis is unclear from the evidence. But even if the court finds that the state carried its burden of showing a basis for the stop, Officer McCray's claims about probable cause to search the car are simply not credible. We know from the studies cited in the defense brief that study participants in the passenger compartment of cars are unable to smell five pounds of marijuana in a garbage bag in the trunk. The metal container in this case was closed. Officer McCray used what looks like a pocket knife to pry it open. Whatever residue he claims was in that container was too small to see on video. Officer McCray claims that he smelled an immeasurably small quantity of marijuana residue enclosed in a metal container in the passenger door compartment from where he stood outside the driver's door. This is simply not humanly possible. We're asking the court to suppress the evidence, not because the smell of marijuana can never be probable cause, but because Officer McCray's claim about smelling marijuana is not credible. Nobody could smell what Officer McCray claims he smelled. In determining whether Officer McCray actually smelled marijuana, the court should consider the likelihood that Officer McCray recognized the name Jade Mallory when he ran the car's plates. Mr. Mallory was convicted on federal charges after he was caught with pipe bombs in Madrid. Additionally, the court should consider the likelihood that Officer McCray got the impression that Ms. Heidsick was a drug user or an addict, and on that basis made up an excuse to search that he knew was unlikely to invoke uh, judicial scrutiny. Even if the court chooses to believe that Officer McCray has superhuman olfactory det detection abilities, allowed him to smell the unsmellable. Probable cause to search the car evaporated as soon as he found that cigarette case. As the state pointed out in their rebuttal brief, per United States v. Ross, when there's probable cause to search a car, the officer can search every part of the car that may conceal the object of the search. After Officer McRae located the object of the search, there was no part of the car left that could have concealed it. The object of the search was in his hand. He he didn't have probable cause to justify continuing his search. Additionally, had he actually smelled marijuana in the car after finding the cigarette case, he wouldn't have ended his search immediately after finding methamphetamine. Had he actually smelled marijuana in the car, he would have called for a drug dog or, or continued his search, asked another officer, done something more. It's clear from the evidence in this case that Officer, officer McRae invented probable cause to justify a drug search. 
And in doing so, he violated Ms. Heidsick's constitutional rights. And we're asking the court not to lend the appearance of legitimacy to this flagrant constitutional violation. Beyond that, the defense would rest on the contents of the written filings. And thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Ms. Sears. Mr. Spears, any, uh, any response? Thank you, Your Honor. The state did also file a resistance to the defendant's motion to suppress. I would ask you to consider that, and I'm going to offer just a brief oral argument at this time. Uh, first of all, Ms. Sears did include a number of attachments to her brief. Uh, to the extent that those are considered evidence, I do not think they are. Uh, furthermore, I would caution the court as to the weight given to those uh, attachments because, of course, I, I don't have the opportunity to examine the persons that author those. There's some, um, there's some tests, there's some scientific tests, articles, and then a, an opinion from New York, which would be um, persuasive authority at most. Uh, at the end of the day, Your Honor, this really boils down to a, a credibility determination by the court. Uh, Officer McRae, excuse me, Deputy McRae, testified here today. He uh, testified well. He testified as to things within his knowledge. He was not trying to over-exaggerate. Uh, he testified as to his training and experience, uh, and he has no motive to fabricate such a story. Um, and then you turn to the defendant's expert witness, uh, as to the question of credibility, Your Honor, his testimony, um, at least to this counsel, is a farce. He is a former police officer turned uh, expert on getting away with crime. It's not even that he's an expert in the field of uh, drug odors. It's not even ex uh, that he's a scientific expert. He's an expert on how to break the law and get away with it. Yeah, he's admitted to lying, he's admitted to stealing when a police officer, to the extent that he has been called in this hearing simply to uh, comment on the credibility of another witness uh, is improper. Uh, and I do not think the court should give any weight to the testimony of the wit expert witness that you've heard here today. I think the court can examine um, the testimony of Deputy McRae. If it, the Deputy McRae is to be believed, there's probable cause to search the vehicle and probable cause to search every container which could contain marijuana. And for those reasons and the reasons in my brief, I ask the court to deny the defendant's motion to suppress. All right. Thank you. Matter submitted. Uh, I'll get a ruling out as promptly as I can. Uh, I will warn you ahead of time, though, we'll, we'll, just because of what, everything that's going on, that will not be as prompt as promptly as I'd like to have it, nor as promptly as you'd like to have it, but I will do my best to get it out as quickly as I can. Um, as I understand it, Ms. Sears, you waive speedy trial in this case, is that right? I believe so, Your Honor, but I'll verify that. Yeah, that's not a, that's not a justification for me to uh, drag this out, and I won't, but I, uh, but I wanted to uh, be sure what the situation was. The case is set for trial on October 26th, is that right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, all right. Um, and then, you know, I'll try to get it out far enough ahead that both of you uh, uh, have some idea of what to do with, with this topic at trial. Uh, thank you. We're adjourned. Thank you.